Snyderman is from the Rochester Museum and Science Center, and he's going to give a presentation about the eclipse, which you probably all read about in the brochure if you got that. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to let Dan take over and tell us all about it. Sounds good. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. I am Dan Schneiderman. I am the Eclipse Partnership Coordinator at the Rochester Museum and Science Center, or at least I will be for the next 33 days. <laughs> Uh, we'll see what happens that, well, the day after, I'm probably going to be uh, asleep and dead to the world, but we'll see. Uh, before we jump in, I ask this before every presentation, has anyone here seen a total solar eclipse? Uh, how about a partial solar eclipse? Perfect. Uh, I am in that partial uh, group as well. I have yet to see a total solar eclipse. So to jump in, oh, I am off by a day. Uh, the total solar eclipse is this year, it is just under five weeks away, it's 32 days away. Uh, that is much closer than I care to admit. <laughs> uh, to give you a little bit of background on how long that we've been counting down, uh, I stepped into this role in 2021, and I had been volunteering for two years before that as the Rochester Eclipse Task Force has been meeting since 2019. Uh, if you wanna hear even further back, our previous planetarium director, Steve Fentress, was talking up the eclipse all the way back in 2012. So we, we've been talking about this and preparing for a long time at the Rochester Museum and Science Center. So very, very basic science. When the geometry allows, moon in front of sun casts giant shadow. We are in that shadow. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's what it all comes down to. But to kind of go into a bit more detail, this is actually what the view should be on April 8th, 2024 at about 3.20 p.m. What you see here is the moon completely blocking out the sun's disk, leaving the sun's outer atmosphere to be seen kind of highlighting the moon, kind of just surrounding it. It's almost like a velvet hole in the middle of the sky. You might even see a few stars here. Yes, this is from 2017, and I'll give it a little bit more accurate of what we'll be able to see that day. But what don't you see in this picture? Light. Now you can still see some light. We, we do have a star too, clouds. We don't have any clouds in this photo, and that is what we should all keep in mind for April 8th, 2024, is hopefully not to see clouds. I do want to point out, hey, yesterday has not been the best of weather days, but oh, Monday and Tuesday were excellent and perfect eclipse viewing weather. If it's like weather, uh, this past Monday, oh, I am afraid of what it's going to be like at the museum. <laughs> There are a couple different types of solar eclipses out there. So there are partial eclipses when the moon, you know, only covers partial. There's annular eclipses when the moon uh, in its orbit, there are times when it's closer to us and times when it's further away from us. And when it's slightly further away, it doesn't quite cover the entire sun from our point of view. And it leaves this ring of fire. Uh, this is, you know, our annular eclipses. There was one this past October in other parts of the U.S. And then we have total solar eclipses when the moon is slightly closer to us. And so from our point of view here on Earth, it completely blocks out the sun's disk. Now, all of this is, you know, due to some very lucky math where the sun might be 400 times larger than the moon. The moon is about 400 times closer to us. So yet again, from our perspective here on Earth, they're about the exact same size. And to give you an idea of what that's like, well, if you were to take a 10-foot sun uh, or an orange foot or orange tablecloth, the Earth would be about an inch in scale. And if you were to look at the moon, it would be a quarter of an inch. And it's a little hard to see here, but that right there would be the earth compared to that sun. And the earth to the moon, about three feet away from each other, it's, it fits on a yardstick, but the sun to the earth would be about 1,074 feet. We did the math on this and then we're like, well, let's double check the math. And we did this at scale 
still on our museum grounds. So while we have that 10 foot sun, we have a quarter inch moon completely blocking it out. This is what's going to happen on April 8th, 2024, but at a much larger scale. <laughs> Another way to think about this is I want all of you to walk out my head using your thumb. Thank you so much for saying I'm doing a great job. <laughs> so as you walk out my head, I'm sure a lot of you can fully block it out. Well, your thumb is not bigger than my head, but it's a lot closer to you. So you're able to block it out. This is basically what's happening during a total solar eclipse is the moon is blocking it out from our perspective just because it's so much closer. So why don't we see them more often? Well, technically we do. They tend to happen about uh, eclipses in general every six to eight months somewhere on Earth. What are you doing? Uh, for total solar eclipses, they happen about every 18 to 24 months somewhere on Earth. But they're a bit more rare than you think for any given location. So the average time for any given location to experience a total solar eclipse twice is about 375 to 400 years. Here in Rochester, we're lucky. Our average is closer to 100 to 120 years. Not great from the human scale, but much better on the cosmic scale. And one thing I want to share, I've only shared this uh, once or twice. This is a new animation by our planetarium director, Jim uh, Bader. I will say that was the only video that had sound uh, to play. <laughs> so what will we actually see on April 8th, 2024? The first thing is, well, the moon blocking out the sun and it hitting dark out. It won't get midnight dark out. It won't be this dark out. It'll be more like a deep twilight. I want you to think of an hour after sunset. It's more of a deep blue. If you were to uh, look at the horizon, it's like a 360 degree sunset. You should be able to see a couple of planets during totality. Jupiter and Venus will be fairly easy. Uh, if you're at a high enough vantage point, you might be able to see Saturn and Mars if you know where to look. The brightest of stars will be visible. Uh, the one constellation I'm telling everyone to look for is Orion. Orion should be fairly easy to see during the eclipse. Uh, specifically, look for those three stars in Orion's belt. And then we have the diamond ring effect and Bailey's beads. So the moon's surface is not a perfect sphere. There's a lot of craters and valleys. And because of this, in the last couple of seconds leading into totality, light escapes through those valleys and craters. And it almost looks like it's dancing on the edge of the moon. The diamond ring effect, this is probably what you think of when you see a photo of a total solar eclipse. It's that almost burst of light as we enter totality, as that moon just completely covers the sun's disk. Usually at this point, you'll probably hear a lot of cheering, uh, no matter where you are. And you won't realize that you are cheering yourself. To give you an idea about how the moon moves across, well, it doesn't move as you might see in some graphics, you know, horizontally across the sun. It kind of goes at this curved angle and it, you know, creates these more horn-like images, uh, kind of more cookies even with a giant bite out of it. So this is the entire process, uh, two and a half hours sped up into about five seconds. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't really get dark into the last couple of moments 
before totality and really in the last couple seconds entering totality. So the whole thing should start at about 2.07 p.m., give or take, depending on your location. As we get closer and closer, more and more of the sun's going to be covered up about 10% every seven minutes. So really, you won't notice it until about 309, 316, as we hit 80, 90, and really at that last minute beforehand, you'll notice how dark it gets really, really quickly. And when you look at photos online, well, here's two different images. Uh, the one with the filter, this is that common misconception of it's gonna be midnight out. This is just with a filter on someone's camera to protect their camera uh, so they don't damage it. The other one is without a filter because it's during totality and you can see that deeper blue. To give you a, another example, and I don't have sound for this, fast forward a little bit. This video was taken by our previous planetarium director, Steve Pentris. Uh, he traveled back in 2017 and here is during totality. It is much darker out compared to where the video starts. So before totality, during totality. But I'm gonna let this play for a couple seconds because he also captures us leaving totality as the moon starts to move and no longer completely covers the sun. Because when light comes back, you realize just how powerful our sun really is, where even the smallest sliver produces an incredible amount of light. You can see it slowly starting to happen uh, in about a moment, and then it rapidly gets bright out. So I believe it's starting to happen here. Yep, that's definitely happening here. And you can, I recommend kind of looking towards the bottom of the screen, and you can see people quickly coming back. I am not speeding this video up. This is playing in real time. So in the last 10 seconds, it just went from fairly dark out to fairly light. <laughs> that was seconds as we exited totality. When people say it's night and day, it really was night and day. I lived in Tennessee when the last one happened. Oh, you definitely yeah, experienced it. Uh, it is not just a visual experience. It is a physical one as well. The temperature should drop by an average of 10 degrees as we enter totality. Uh, remember, you're removing the sun, and the sun has produces so much heat. Uh, animals and plants act as if it was nightfall. Birds back to their nest, cows back to their barn. Uh, I have been asked about household pets. Honestly, your dog, as long as they don't normally look at the sun, they're not going to look at the sun during the eclipse. Uh, cats, they don't care anyhow. <laughs> as, as someone who has had multiple cats in my lifetime, they really will not care. In the 20 minutes before and after totality, if you were to look at your shadow on the ground, it's going to become incredibly sharp. You might even notice some random shadows, which are caused by uh, turbulence in Earth's atmosphere, just kind of being uh, shown on the ground. But the main thing is how eerily still it becomes. You will understand why so many people used to think it was the end of the world. Uh, the hair in the back of your neck might stand up. There's kind of some uneasiness in some people. Yes, you'll hear some people just start cheering, but I have seen footage of people who started laughing crying, hugging each other, folks who have described it as everything melting away except for the sun, the moon, the earth, and themselves. It very much uh, varies person to person. But really, that main thing is how you're just overcome with a sense of awe and wonder. There's really this incredible feeling that you get to experience as you get to go through a total solar eclipse. Uh, if you are planning ahead, uh, which I recommend everyone do, uh, you are going to want to look about south-southwest uh, to 45 degrees up to see where the sun is. That's where the eclipse will be taking place uh, for totality. Honestly, on the day of the eclipse, just between 207 and 433, while wearing your eclipse glasses, look where the sun should be. The day of, you don't have to plan out too much. 
If you're looking for Jupiter, it's going to be much higher up on the horizon, Venus a little bit lower down. And here is Saturn and Mars, as I mentioned. So this question, this is by far the number one question when it comes to the eclipse, especially for New York. I also have to say for really all of the East Coast, but. And here's the thing. We have no control over the sun, the moon, the earth, or the weather. No matter what, the eclipse is still going to take place and it will still get dark. In fact, it will probably feel even darker compared to uh, a clear day during the eclipse. I want you to think about yesterday morning and this morning uh, as you got up. Did it feel much darker out this morning as the sun was rising while it was extra cloudy? Same concept, just much later in the day. And well, here's the thing. There's been a lot of people who've been studying weather and eclipses for many years and they've taken a lot of data. Uh, this shows the average cloud amount uh, in the sky on April 8th across uh, Mexico, the US, and I think into Canada as well on this graph. Rochester's not as bad as you would think compared to other cities. Yes, Cleveland's slightly better than us, but I like pointing something out. I want you to think about our friends in Buffalo and sometimes Syracuse when they get slammed with maybe two, three, four, five feet of snow. And what do we sometimes end up with? Barely an inch. Where we are on Lake Ontario really helps us. We have a lovely microclimate that, you know, sometimes our friends might get clouded over and sometimes we get clear skies. And I mean, if you were to look to the east of us, we're the last good place on the east coast, uh, probability wise for clouds. Yes, it gets pretty good in uh, a little bit better in Arkansas, better in Texas, and then it gets really good in Mexico. You know, here is a little zoomed in uh, version of New York State. Yet again, Rochester, one of the best places. Dan, excuse me. Yep. Can you get rid of that lower bar at all? Yes, I'm this just is... trying to remember how to hide it. Yeah. It just comes up one of the black yep. things. Uh, let me see if I can quickly hide. Hide floating mean controls. There we are. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yep. I hope so. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, and, you know, if we're to look at weather data, I have to preface this. A single data point does not make a pattern. But I really love this data point. This is April 8th, 2023, almost a year ago. Look, look at us. <laughs> Barely a cloud in the sky, it was 40 to 50 degrees out that day, sunny. A couple of us were running around the region uh, with a documentary crew talking about the eclipse being one year out. Perfect weather. And in fact, we've had really good weather in early April before. Yes, not all of these are April 8th. Uh, some of them are your day before or after, but we have had good weather. I also want to point out this winter. We've had a really weird, uh, I almost want to put quotations on the marks, winter. Uh, the fact that we have one of the warmest winters on record, it's been almost April weather out now. That might help us out a bit. Uh, technically, we are in an El Nino year, which means uh, warmer weather and a bit drier. Uh, it's weird to say on a night like tonight. But, you know, We've had a couple really nice days that would be perfect for the eclipse. We've had a lot of really nice days that would be perfect for the eclipse. We've been taking full advantage of it at the museum. Yes, if you were to look at a much larger data set, as uh, some of our local meteorologists have, we still only have about 50 to 60% chance of it not being overcast. And there's a reason why I combine that clear to mostly cloudy ranges. And that is because during, uh, as we get closer to totality, 
a lot of clouds tend to dissipate. And to give you an idea of what this looks like, well, here is Homestead National Monument in 2017. Uh, this was, uh, they had 20,000 people out there. Don't mind the science guy was out there. Uh, and if you look at the background, you can see heavy rain and thunderstorms. There's actually lightning not too long before this video started. Now, I'm going to rotate this. As you can see, it's fairly dark out in the background. I'm going to start fast forwarding a little bit. So as you can see, jumping in about a minute, it's going to take a second to load. Uh, you'll start to see some clouds dissipate. Ooh. Uh, they haven't quite hit totality yet. But now I'm going to jump a little bit further in. Yet again, only about a minute difference. And look at that. At the last second, the clouds parted or dissipated, and they were still able to see totality. This is something that has happened at other eclipses. Yes, it, it's much more overcast in the clouds or higher up in the atmosphere. Yeah, it will still be rough. But this could happen as well. Uh, honestly, if you've heard the video here, it is a massive roar of uh, just people too. I do also want to mention something that happened at Carbondale, Illinois. Very lucky people. They're about uh, five hours south of Chicago. They got to be in the path of 2017 and they get to be it uh, again in 2024. At SIU, they jammed thousands of people in a football stadium. Mostly clear day. But at the last possible second, a cloud formed over the stadium. They were still able to view it at the very end of totality, but if you were, say, one building over, you got to experience the entirety of it. <laughs> and the reason why I love bringing this up again is uh, a few weeks ago, I was out in Phelps uh, talking to their uh, business chamber, and, well, one of the people there was in that stadium that day. And he said, I want you to imagine eight to 10,000 people booing the cloud. <laughs> and that is what happened. Uh, and I mean, thankfully they all cheered afterwards and there's something to be said about that story. Cool. To take a bird's eye view, uh, here is the official NASA map for the 2023 eclipse, which took place here across this path and the upcoming 2024 eclipse. Back in 2017, the eclipse went from one coast to the other. It was called the Great American Eclipse. This time, it's the Great North American Eclipse as it touches Mexico and Canada mm -hmm. as well. To kind of clean it up a little, here are all of the major cities within the path. Uh, I love pointing out how Buffalo and Rochester are basically dead center in the path. We have perfect views, especially compared to some of these larger cities that are closer to the edge. Uh, it literally cuts uh, San Antonio in half, uh, which is wild. Mm -hmm. But let's zoom in a bit more. Here is New York State. Everywhere in between these two blue lines will get to experience totality. The closer you are to that red line, the longer it will be. Uh, for those who are out in Brockport, specifically SUNY Brockport, they are so lucky because it goes right through their football stadium. <laughs> uh, for which I know they're doing a big thing. They get about five more seconds compared to where I am at the Rochester Museum and Science Center. There's a couple other things I like pointing out on this map. Uh, what connects Cleveland, Buffalo, Rochester, and Syracuse? <laughs> I-90. If there was one place I recommend avoiding on April 8th, 2024, is I-90. And the reason why I say that is, well, actually, I'll get into that reason in a little bit when we start talking about traffic. The other thing I like pointing out is I want you to think about everyone who lives in this region. Everyone who lives in that path. Every single one of them will get to experience totality. Your friends, your neighbors, all the school kids, 
uh, the people you drive by every day, every single one of them will get to experience this. It is just one of those great moments, a positive shared, it's one of those great moments that's a positive shared experience that you can say millions of people look up and get to experience this one moment in time. And to give you an idea of where we are on the path, Plainville's looking pretty good. We're all in the path right here. And I have to say location very much is important, but we'll get to that in a second. Uh, if you were to look for the information for literally right where we are standing, here is when the eclipse will begin and end. The whole thing starts at about 2.06 p.m. in 30 seconds. Totality will last at 3 minutes and 11 seconds. Kicks off at 3.20 p.m. Uh, it will be quite the sight. I actually think I might be off by maybe a second with uh, 3.18. Uh, with the 19. Uh, and then the whole thing ends uh, when the moon no longer overlaps the sun at 4.33 p.m. To give you an idea of how fast that shadow is moving across New York State, well, one of the fun questions I've been asked about I-90 is, well, if I was to be on there, could I drive really, really fast to keep up with the eclipse? <laughs> Answer is no. <laughs> that shadow is going from one end of the state to the other, starting at about 2,200 miles per hour and ending around 2,700 miles per hour. Uh, so it crosses the state in about 11 to 12 minutes. Wow. <laughs> you can't be in any vehicle on Earth going that fast. At least any vehicle you can easily access. That's <laughs> great. <laughs> Just a little fast. The other thing I want to bring up is location very much matters. So yes, where we are right right now is excellent in timing. It's honestly probably the best place in the finger lakes for the longest amount of time. Because if you start going over and start heading a bit more east, well, the length of totality gets shorter and shorter. And in fact, you have to be very careful in some locations. Uh, uh, almost two years ago, I was out in Penyan. I gave a presentation to their uh, tourism board. Totality would only last about 39 minutes where the meeting was held. If you were to go down the road to where the holiday party was, you would be outside the path of totality. You wouldn't be able to take your eclipse glasses off. So location very much matters. And 99.9% .9 coverage of the sun is not totality. It gives you views like this. This is about 94, 95% of the sun being covered. And here is 99.39% of the sun being covered. <clears throat> that small sliver of light could still damage your eyes if you were to look at it without eclipse glasses. Only during totality, during that three minutes and 11 seconds, can you actually remove your eclipse glasses? And we recommend it and look up and do that one thing you were always told not to do, which is stare at the sun, <laughs> because they inflate the moons in the way. But not a second more. If you are curious about how long totality lasts, there are a lot of really good interactive maps out there. We have links to a number of them off of our website. Uh, for a quick little bit of history, I do like mentioning, uh, yes, we did have an eclipse. Technically, before this area was known as the Greater Rochester area by, I think, 12 years. Uh, so it happened back in 1806. The last time it happened in the Greater Rochester region was in 1925. Uh, there's a lot of great stories on it. Uh, we've been able to track down about a dozen articles from 1924 and 1925 talking about that eclipse. My favorite bit is on April 24th, 1925. Uh, in one paragraph in the DNC, it talks about the next time you'll be able to see a total solar eclipse is 2024. <laughs> and those people will have to get prepared. Almost 100 years. It is very weird reading about people predicting what you are doing now, 99 years ago. Uh, for which I'm sure we'll be talking about what's coming up because, well, the last whole solar eclipse in the U.S. was in 2017. But looking forward, it gets a bit interesting. 
Technically, if there's a total solar eclipse in Alaska in 2033. There is one in Montana and the Dakotas in 2044, but the next major one isn't until 2045. We only get about 50% of uh, the sun being covered up then. In 2079, we get another total solar eclipse in New York State. It hits more downstate. We'll get about 90% up here in Rochester. But the next time we get to experience a total solar eclipse right here, 2144, 120 years from now. If a kid is born on April 8th, 2024, their grandkids' kid, or more likely grandkids' grandkid, will get to experience that eclipse. It's a long period of time to wait. So, you know, thankfully we have April 8th coming up. Now, we are expecting hundreds of thousands of people coming across the nine county region. I do want to mention this is the entire nine counties. It's just not the city, not Monroe, but the entire nine counties, and it's people coming in on the day of the eclipse. Yes, there's a lot of people staying overnight at the hotels, which are mostly sold out. Uh, out of curiosity, has any, is anyone's family staying with them for the eclipse? A couple of you. Uh, I have put a ban on my house unless they want to be put to work. <laughs> uh, but that's what a lot of people are doing right, right now. Uh, this also includes people coming in from right outside the path within the lower half of the Finger Lakes, the Southern Tier, and other parts of the state. There are already 4 million residents living within the path within New York, which is just incredible. Uh, to give you another idea about where some people are coming from, uh, since a lot of people are like, are people really coming to Rochester? Well, this is data from the RMSC's festival. Uh, we decided to map out the zip code. In fact, I think this graphic is already a week old. Uh, and I just haven't updated it yet because there's a lot more people coming than you would think. Uh, the East Coast is just being slammed with people coming here from uh, New York, Boston, DC, uh, Philly, Pittsburgh, uh, we have some people coming in from the West Coast and flying in because they really don't get any view of totality. And it's because we have to wait that next 21 years until we get to see it again. And this is just a people who have said, yeah, I'm coming to the RMSC at some point that weekend. This doesn't include the hotels or any of the other festivals and events. I'm often asked why this is important. And, you know, first wearing my museum hat, I have to say, oh, this is a great chance to talk about the stars, to get into astronomy, talk about science. Uh, it's even a chance for us to do this in science. I love the tourism aspect. I get to talk about Rochester and everything going on in this region. Uh, literally, in my office, I have a bottle of Eclipse wine. I have some of the Eclipse beer, chocolate, uh, coffee that people have been working on. I get to brag about us. Uh, nationwide, that's a lot of fun. Uh, but then there's also the cultural impact. Almost every religion and culture uh, throughout history has some connection to eclipses. Uh, they've happened in the Bible. They've happened in different mythology. They've happened all over the place. You can find it in pop culture, from everything to a uh, Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court, where it was a whole plot point. Uh, Little Shop of Horrors, if you enjoyed that as well. Uh, it's been on Sesame Street and The Simpsons a dozen times each because both of those shows have been on forever. Uh, it just continuously pops up again and again and again. And of course, there's that one song that comes to everyone's mind, Total Eclipse of the Heart by Bonnie, uh, Bonnie Tyler. I cannot wait to not hear that song. <laughs> I have heard it way too many times. <laughs> Uh, but really, as I mentioned earlier, it's just such a positive shared experience that you get to share with, you know, hundreds of millions of people anywhere in the continental U.S. because everyone still gets some view of the eclipse, even if it's not total. And there's something different for everyone. I've heard stories of people saying they're going to celebrate the eclipse uh, with their family. Uh, I just heard about a event for people doing blind dates that day, <laughs> which honestly is a hilarious concept to me. But I've also heard of people uh, gathering for family reunions, for weddings, uh, for meeting uh, new family members. 
And on the other side, I've heard of people saying that they were spreading people's ashes during the eclipse because it's a chance for everyone to be in town. It's something, it's very different for every person. And as I've chatted throughout the region over the last couple of years, I have come to the term that everyone under the sun is a stakeholder. I've been talking to manufacturers, hospitals, uh, everyone from uh, daycares, the senior centers, universities, schools, all sorts of restaurants. Everyone will be impacted by the eclipse one way or another. Now, speaking of impacted, well, as I mentioned earlier, there's an issue that we all are going to have to be aware of. So I'm not too worried about the traffic leading into the eclipse. Thankfully, it's on a Monday. I'm not too terribly worried about people really just all showing up at once. It's going to be a bit more of a trickle on Saturday and Sunday. But if you were to look at 2017, there was one pattern that kind of happened. About 15 minutes after totality, people said, wow, what a view. I can't believe I got to experience this. This was worth every second of driving getting here. Let's head home. <laughs> now, I want you to multiply that by tens of hundreds of thousands of people across the entire US. We saw some of the worst traffic ever. And I want to say the average uh, time that's using Carbondale, Illinois. It's about five hours south of Chicago. The return trip was about 12 hours. I want to say the worst incident uh, was due to a one-way bridge and traffic backed up for about 20 hours. That's an outlier, I will say that. And well, we've known about this issue and thankfully 2017 happened. We can plan ahead. And so our plan has been to decentralize as much as possible. Yes, we're having a lot of people come here, but we're also telling people to stay a little bit longer and keep people off the roads. Uh, because, well, if you were to go east or west, you're going to run into other eclipse traffic from Buffalo and Syracuse. You can't really go north because you run into a lake. <laughs> if there was any day for the fast ferry to return, I swear it's April 8, 2024. <laughs> But otherwise, everyone's going to be taking every other route. I personally expect a lot of people to be driving through the Finger Lakes and just kind of heading south, especially to all of those cities that I've mentioned all beforehand. We are trying to keep people an extra day. We have a whole campaign around it, but we are mapping out uh, all the traffic issues. Just plan to stay local. If you have any family or friends coming in, keep them for an extra day if you can. One of the other big issues is Monday, well, that's typically a school day. The week before is usually April break, and 3.20 p.m. is a common dismissal time. We don't want kids, you know, being on a bus and missing out. I can't imagine a, a bus driver pulling off to the side of the road, getting all the kids off the bus, getting them to put on their eclipse glasses and take them off at the right time, then getting them all back on the bus, and then continuing onwards. We also don't want kids stuck at school or not being able to get home afterwards due to the traffic. So after a lot of debate, we started this conversation in uh, 2019 because we knew this was gonna happen. Uh, it took a year and a half to two years, but we convinced almost every school district in the nine county to cancel school that day. Uh, so we are hoping everyone stays home with their families. I have heard some businesses are actually closing early that day as well, or holding their own viewing party so that they're saying, hey, invite all your families in and you can celebrate here. Uh, we'll provide food, we'll provide snacks. Safety. You should never ever directly look at the sun except under two conditions. One, during totality, so for that three minutes and 11 seconds for right here, or two, when you are wearing eclipse glasses. And these are not like regular sunglasses. They block out about 99.9% .9 of light. The only thing you should ever be able to see while wearing them is maybe the brightest of light bulbs. I'm talking like stage lighting or the sun. That's the only thing you'll ever really be able to see with them. And if you were thinking about ordering off of Amazon, 
please double check first. Back in 2017, they actually had to recall a lot of Eclipse glasses a few days before the e Eclipse. And then all of a sudden there was a run on them. Thankfully, uh, the American Astronomical Society has been checking out these Eclipse glasses uh, and they have a full list on their website of approved buyers and resellers for our region. We're probably one of the most prepared regions for the Eclipse. At the RMSC, we have ordered half a million glasses. We're even trying to, uh, we're talking to one of the manu manufacturers and maybe even ordering slightly more. All of our libraries have glasses as well through a library, uh, a nationwide library program. Some of our local counties have bought glasses in universities and hospitals and all these other groups. By my rough estimate, there's about 750,000 glasses in our nine county region. And not every person in your family needs to be wearing them at the same time. Sharing is very much caring <laughs> because you are probably not going to be looking up the entire time of, of the eclipse. And now we're in 13 minutes for the uh, partial phases. You're going to hurt your neck. <laughs> You're going to need like a lawn chair almost to look up the entire time. Do not recommend that. I recommend sharing with a few family members. Our general advice is two per family. Uh, if you have any kids or grandkids, please make sure that they can share. Uh, I, that is my main caveat with families is, as long as your kids are good, we're good. This is not the only method to view the eclipse. During the partial phases, you can make a pinhole projector. Has anyone here ever made one, probably out of a cardboard box? A couple hands. This is not the only way to do this. In fact, you can use almost any object with a small, tiny hole. For example, colanders. This is using a basic strainer. Metal ones work better than plastic. And I want you to remember this. Please do not hold it up and look through it directly at the sun. They're called pinhole projectors because you want to look at the projection underneath. Uh, so you can do this with colanders. Uh, you can use it with your hands interlocking them. Uh, I've even seen people use pegboard, different car index cards with hole punches. You can even use saltines and Ritz crackers. <laughs> we have done this at the museum. A couple of us keep them in our offices. Uh, the ones in my office are from October, from that eclipse. They are very stale at this point. But if you were to get a pack a few days beforehand, you have a nice viewing method and a snack to have afterwards. Uh, and as I mentioned, yes, you can still find glasses locally at your libraries, your rec centers. A lot of people are getting them. We have the whole map on our website of where you can find your nearest location. Uh, what's not on the map because I don't want to enter all the places myself. Uh, I do know that Wegmans and Tops both have Eclipse glasses at their stores. And here's more of those methods as well. Uh, if you have access to a 3D printer, some people do this. Uh, I know some libraries are printing them out. We're trying to print out a few more at the museum. And yet again, please do not use sunglasses. I reiterate this time and time again because I have seen people do this at different locations. If you do somewhat, see someone using sunglasses, please go over to them and kindly say, those just are not safe enough. If you want to take a photo with your phone during the eclipse, uh, and you have a spare pair of Eclipse glasses, not everyone wants to do this, I recommend cutting your glasses in half and taping them to your phone. Uh, we did this a week ago, uh, and that's a sunspot that you were able to just kind of see. Uh, even if you were wearing the Eclipse glasses, we had a massive sunspot last week, uh, which was just fantastic. Uh, so you can do things just like this. If you are running your own Eclipse viewing event, I don't, I'm not going to go through everything here. Couple notes though. Please turn off your automatic lights. They will turn on. So if you have any outdoor lights, please turn them off. It will enhance your experience a little bit. Uh, I wanted to, of course, come up with backup weather plans. If you're looking for music, there's a ton of playlists out there. Yes, yet again, total Eclipse of the Heart, but there's plenty more songs. I also recommend 
here comes the sun and uh, eclipsed by uh, Pink Floyd. There's, there's very long list. Uh, the other thing I want you to think about is please have a dedicated timekeeper within your family or friends group. That way you have someone to say, hey, we can remove your eclipse glasses and someone, uh, that same person can say, please put them back on. You can even give yourself a few second buffer. You're already getting a longer experience than anyone did back in 2017. The longest time back then was two and a half minutes. We get a much better length here at this time. And I want you to think about one last thing. Think about who you want to experience the eclipse with and where you want to experience it with, because you will always remember both of those points forevermore. We are encouraging people to spend the eclipse with their loved ones, with their family, with their friends. Even at the museum, we're having our staff meet up with our families. I can tell you when we hit totality, I'm gonna to be right next to my wife and holding my daughter. I've known that's the experience I've always wanted the entire time. And I'm encouraging everyone to think about that as well. If you are looking for other Eclipse events, I do want to call it an, a quick plug for uh, the festival that we're doing at the RMSC. Uh, we are going to have three full days of Eclipse activities from planetarium shows, singing Tesla coils. We're bringing in national speakers. Uh, we also have a lot of speakers locally, including uh, professors from RIT and U of R. We have performances by Rock City Ballet. Uh, and we have uh, some engineers who have work out in space local engineers, and you know, lots of lovely people from around the region. But we're not the only festival in town. Uh, there's gonna be, it was just enough, I need to have a slide for this. Uh, the Red Wings announced yesterday that for that weekend, they are changing their name to the Rochester Moon Rocks, R-O-C, <laughs> uh, for the entire weekend. They have their own Jersey logos. We've actually collaborated with them. Um, uh, they have multiple games. That's opening weekend, uh, which, you know, that's a great chance for an opening weekend. And then they're doing a, they don't have a game on the day of the eclipse, but they're still going to be out there celebrating. Uh, a lot of libraries will. The Genesee Country Village and Museum is doing a 19th century approach to it. You can find events everywhere. There's something for everyone from, you know, that blind, date uh, experience that I mentioned to a 5k. I've even heard of a Euchre tournament taking place uh, leading up to the eclipse. Uh, if you're looking for events, here's just a handful of them. Uh, other things I want to point out, there is a lot of music and art being done around the eclipse. Genesee County, oh, they got on board right away. They're doing this whole Jenna C the Eclipse. It's a really good pun. They ended up coming up with a children's book to go along with it. And the proceeds are actually dedicated to local farm animals uh, and supporting them. Uh, a middle school did a musical. The RPO is going to do a whole concert the night before the eclipse. A lot of people are just getting on board. Uh, we have commissioned Eclipse artwork at the museum. This was done by Tyler Nordgren, who is an Ithaca resident. Uh, he's an artist and astronomer. He's done work not only for us locally, but he has done work for national parks, for state parks. Uh, he's done it for other space-related events. And because he's in the region, well, we're a little bit lucky because he created a poster for the Erie Canal. He created a poster for the Finger Lakes, for which I want to point out that Lakeville is on that poster. Uh, I mean, he is a Finger Lakes resident. He was going to do this one way or another. <laughs> uh, even Wayne County has done one. He's done one for New York State, uh, which is out there. Uh, you can buy all of his posters online and we're actually stocking them at the museum. So he's done a lot of Eclipse related artwork locally. He's actually gonna be giving a talk at the museum a week from Friday, we just cemented this. Uh, we are, we do have a countdown on our website. This was from a few days ago uh, at 41 days. So uh, that thing is just counting down until we hit totality. It does take into account for daylight savings because that is coming up. 
Uh, and if you want to follow along online, we do have a newsletter. We are posting more information on a regular basis. We're just trying to really promote as much as we possibly can. Uh, we do have national news crews popping through Rochester between now and the eclipse. Uh, so be on the lookout on some of those shows as well. Uh, and with that, if you have any questions, mm -hmm. I can answer them right now. I know that covered a lot of information. I have a question. Yes. Thank you. That was wonderful. Very entertaining. Um, can you explain the pinhole, how to, how to do that? I'm not familiar with that. Uh, with the cardboard box or the other methods? Any of them, any of them, like the salting crackers or the So with them, you are basically going to hold your cracker or other pinhole device uh, angled so that the sun is, you know, here and looking through your device. And you're going to have one, either a piece of paper or you can put your hand or some other device underneath it to look at uh, the projection underneath it. With a cardboard box, it's a similar thing, and it depends on how you want to build your cardboard box. Uh, because some people just kind of do a hole in the top and kind of angle it so that you can kind of look, where you're looking away from the eclipse and you're pointing the hole towards the sun. You look back in history, uh, any idea when people were smart enough to figure out or predict reliably when it was going to take place? Uh, millennia ago. Uh, because eclipses are extremely predictable, they happen about every 18 years, 11 days, and 8 hours. Uh, it's on a very predictable cycle, and then it moves over about 120 degrees over on the Earth. And we know all of these cycles, a number of civilizations were able to actually figure this out. And if you were to go out to San Antonio, about an hour away from there, you can find cave drawings that actually show this cycle. Uh, not quite with the numbers, but they do relative, they knew that an eclipse was coming. The um, glasses, now have there been studies done like from 2017 of people that you know used them correctly? Were there any eye damage or anything? Uh, not really. I mean, as long as most people follow the general advice of wearing them whenever you look at the sun, I mean, thankfully, it hurts when you look at the sun any other time. Uh, people, there wasn't as much eye damage as you would think. Uh, a lot of the hospitals that were preparing weren't preparing for eye damage. They were preparing for all the other stupid things that happen when people go out and view, just look straight up in the middle of the day or at events. Uh, you know, I'm more worried about people twisting their ankles in the mud. These things can happen. So where we live, there's a lot of hills and valleys. Yes. Recommendations for people on the Finger Lakes, where to orient yourself to see without it falling behind the tree lines. In theory, it should be high enough up, with it being at 45 degrees. Uh, if you do want to go on top of the hill, sometimes if you have a wide enough area, you can actually see the shadow approaching. I'm often asked, where's the best place to view the eclipse? And as long as you're in the path of totality, you're fine. Uh, as Yet again, as much as I would love to ask everyone to come to the museum, I can't handle thousands. I can handle about maybe 10,000 people at best. That's still a lot of people, but there's a lot more people elsewhere in the region. We're trying to decentralize. We're encouraging so many events. Or even encouraging people to enjoy at home. So if I park my boat in the middle of the lake, I can see the shadow from Possibly. That would be quite the experience. Yeah, you won't. This area is kind of surrounded more by the hills around. You really have to be much higher up. No, if you were in the on Lake Ontario, well, you might, and it very much depends on where on Lake Ontario. Dan, can you hear me? Okay, we are expecting a lot of people to be out. Uh, one other cool location I do want to toss out there, it will be right over Niagara Falls, like it will be over Horseshoe Falls, uh, and NASA's even setting up shop there. They're doing a live stream there. 
I do not want to be at that border. I cannot imagine the Rainbow Bridge that day. Who knows what the Maid of the Mist is going to charge? Uh, because that would be quite the location. Uh, but I know that they're doing a whole big event out there. Of other things to note, I can tell you there's Eclipse wine and beer and other uh, fun liquids uh, being released right, right now. Uh, a couple I love calling only now is Roarbox, Strange Bird, and Three Head Brewery all joined up together to do a light beer, a dark beer, and an even darker beer <laughs> to do uh, the different phases of the eclipse, representing when it's a bit lighter out, uh, they starting to get darker, and then during totality. Uh, have you sampled them yet? Uh, yes, yes, I have. <laughs> Uh, I have two of uh, Roarbox Totality Beer in my office right now. Where uh, they're about to be at least in the next week, and then the Genesee Brewery just announced theirs today. A number of other breweries have been announcing theirs. They're they're starting to really come out. Uh, I know there was one distillery that decided to do uh, out by themselves a moonshine. <laughs> like I said, everyone plays into the box. Uh, Dan, we got two things on the chat. Yep. Um, Chipotle Nature Center is offering a solar eclipse viewer maker and take. Ooh. Make and take. Pinhole viewer on March 22nd at 7 to 8.30. That sounds like a great event. Yeah. And uh, somebody said, thank you for a great presentation. Is the Eurasia Museum and Science Center uh, Solar Lab monitoring any impact on the solar power grid? Uh, we're not measuring. I do know some people are, I don't think they're taking measurements on the solar grid, but I know individual solar companies are looking at it. It really won't be for that long that it's impact. It's just a short amount of time. It would be like, uh, you know, that cloudy day. Yeah. Uh, one thing I have been asked, if you have grandkids or young kids, how do you keep glasses on them? And there is a way, and I actually have gone through this because I have a two-year-old. So uh, The way that you do this is, this is an activity developed by NASA. You take a paper plate, and you cut well, a, a hole for the nose for them to, uh, and then you want to cut out small uh, little hole slots for the glasses, but and like two little, you basically cut holes for the uh, eye parts of the glasses and two little slots. That way you can put your glasses on top of it and they just have to hold up the paper plate or you can do like a rubber band or a piece of elastic behind it. Uh, I can tell you I've done this from experience. I did it this past weekend with my daughter. You can also have them decorate it before you put the glasses on. Uh, I always have space stickers at home. So my daughter gets, she has found said space stickers, whether I like it or not. Uh, so there are activities out there. So when you're taking photos with your digital camera, yes. you want to have the filter on until you get the propeller. Correct. Then you take it off. You get some amazing shots with that, right? Yep. Um, any idea of how much before totality and afterwards, you know, like the three umbra, you still have to filter off? Or do you... Maybe a minute, like when we're at like 95 to 99%. I lean closer to 99. It also depends on how much you like your camera. Yeah. Yes. I have met photographers who have sacrificed their cameras to the eclipse. Not many, uh, but yeah, you really need to be ready to take off your filter and put it back on. I almost recommend practicing inside now. Yeah. Um, I also, if you're taking photos, be in a dedicated area away from people walking around. I have heard too many horror stories from 2017, uh, a few public events where there was some dedicated areas for photographers. And... They got close kids and people walk nearby and it put it off just that right amount that cameras just weren't aligned. 
Got one more on the chat mm -hmm. um, from John Connolly. Thanks, Dan, for going into such great detail in your presentation. It's amazing to fully understand the amount of work that has gone into the RMSC's efforts over the last few years. Thank you. It's one of our board members. It, it has been a very much a uh, labor of love. Honestly, this is a dream job because it's a really cool one. Uh, getting to work on something that only will happen in Rochester, not for another 100 years. So I hope someone has my job in 100 years. <laughs> this it means a little less job security for me. <laughs> a little bit of weight. Uh, I will stick around if anyone has any individual questions or comments or thoughts. Uh, but thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Thank you. Unfortunately, it's one they're going to have to go away from my wall. And I have to go into the archives. <laughs> Everything I do is archived okay. for our future exhibits. For, for a hundred years. <laughs> we might get away with 55 years. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.